Well, hello, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to our third session of COVID-19 Colorado and Beyond, sponsored by the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Colorado, Denver, and its continuing and professional education and interdisciplinary studies programs. I'm Marjorie Levine Clark. I'm a professor of history and associate dean for diversity outreach and initiatives in the college, and I'm your moderator for the series. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions during the lecture. We'll collect them all, and we hope to get to as many of your questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Information about student credit and continuing education units can be found on our continuing and professional education website. Students interested in credit have to write a one-page paper for every lecture. I hope the students know that by now. Um, and today's prompt for your paper is, do responses to biological, social, and economic crises have commonalities? I'll say that again. Do responses to biological, social, and economic crises have commonalities? And don't forget, all these questions are posted on our website as well. So now is the time again for thank yous for the many people who made this webinar happen. First, Dean Pam Jansma and Assistant Dean Joanne Porter of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences for supporting this program and making credit available to many of our students at no cost. Our outstanding faculty who volunteered their time for this series, Mike Effler and Noah Dodero, sorry, from the Office of Information Technology, Shana Bull, Amy Arnold, and the Office of Digital Education, Interim Associate Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Joanne Brennan, the University Registrar, Carrie John and her team, Associate Bursar, Eric Gray, Tracy Combe, Director of Marketing and Communication in CLAS, Laurel Dodds, Director of Continuing and Professional Education in CLAS, Course and Curriculum Coordinator, Mary Lovett, also in CLAS, and finally, Kristen Salisbury, Program Manager for CLAS Continuing and Professional Education, who coordinated putting this whole event together under an extremely short timetable. Our lecturer today is Associate Professor Gabriel Finkelstein, my colleague in the History Department. Professor Finkelstein is a historian of science and modern European history who received his PhD from Princeton. His biography of Emile Dubois-Raymond was named one of the best books of 2014 by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And he's looking now um, at the relationship of some scientific critique of history in the 19th century. His lecture today is titled Pandemics in History. Welcome, Professor Finkelstein. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, can you start my video, please? Thank you, Marjorie, for that intro introduction. That's very kind of you. I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to um, join my colleagues at UC Denver in this terrific lecture series. Today, um, I want to review the history of epidemic disease in an attempt to offer some perspective on the current situation. Uh, I hope my remarks remind us that diseases, like other crises, reveal as much about society as they do about history. Oh, excuse me, about biology. So let me um, just simply reiterate Marjorie's question, um, the prompt, do responses to bio biological, social, and economic crises have commonalities? Because my lecture is structured to offer two kinds of answers to that question. So the first answer, the first kind of answer, um, was suggested to me uh, as I was thinking about this uh, after I read a book called Why Things Bite Back, which came out in 1997 by a historian of technology named Edward Tennant. 
a tenant defined technology not as something that actually solves problems, but rather as something that converts acute problems into chronic problems. I'll just reiterate that. Technology doesn't actually solve any problems, it just converts the acute into the chronic. So for example, you can think of automobiles or electric power as technologies in converting the acute to the chronic. And you can think of some less obvious things as technologies, institutions, for example, like banks or insurance. The point Tennant was making is that most people would rather manage a chronic problem than face the crisis of an acute problem. For example, without transportation or loans, you'd be stuck or broke, which isn't all that pleasant. And certainly worse than the alternative of being stuck in traffic or making payments, which are the chronic problems that arise from cars and credit. So in that regard, one can think of public health, financial stimuli, and social welfare as technologies. Because they're forms of government that restore equilibrium to the body politic in the same way that homeostasis in the body restores equilibrium to the physiological body, namely by buffering the effects of epidemic, economic, and political shocks. So in other words, those technologies, those social technologies convert the crises of disease, depression, and disruption into chronic problems that societies can manage more effectively. And now, thinking back over a recent experience of responses to the current pandemic, quarantine, subsidies to businesses and individuals, calls for reforms of farming, policing, and healthcare, these are all clear illustrations of my point. Namely, they, acute, they convert the acute into the chronic. But let me suggest two additional historical examples. The first is the period of crisis in early modern Europe. Now, in 1629, German mercenaries brought the plague to Florence. And lots of people became infected. And just like now, maybe not quite just like now, but similar to now, the poor were regarded as victims and even criminals, as were other undesirable members of the society, like prostitutes and Jews, who were locked up in ghettos. And just like now, shops, churches, schools, taverns, barbers, and even gambling houses were all closed, with the Sanita, which is the name for the Florentine City Health Board, ensuring that the quarantined received deliveries of food, wine, and fire, firewood. And the Senita punished those who broke quarantine. They heard 556 cases between September 1630 and July 1631, most of which, or rather most of whom, excuse me, were arrested in prison and released without a fine. So as a result of these uh, Stringent measures, the plague killed only about 12% of the Florentine population, which is a much lower figure than what was experienced by other Italian cities like Venice, which is about a third, Milan, 46%, and Verona, 61%. Now, even so, some elite Florentines worried that the quarantine would, yeah, this is in the words of one local historian, would give the poor the opportunity to be lazy and lose the desire for, to work. This should sound quite familiar. Now, I want to say that the disaster in Florence was typical of those times, which were marked by cycles of violence, epidemics, and famine, and exacerbated by what the Italian historian Vincenzo Ferroni has described as unending looting, murders, vendettas, and devastations of town and country, which caused demographic damage 
that would not be repaired for half a century. The war was of a new type, radically violent, because it was characterized by unquenchable hatred and scorn toward the enemy. Now the resolution of that early modern crisis wasn't just political in the sense of separating religions of faith, it was also intellectual and that established the ideas of basic human rights that are enshrined in our own constitution. And to me, this is the main import of the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 at the end of the Thirty Years' War. Not that it established the modern system of sovereign European states, uh, but rather that it banned the issuance of letters of mark and reprisal which ended the sanction, the state sanction of piracy. By the same token, most people won't remember that same piece of Westphalia for recognizing the religious principle of quius regio eus religio, where each prince had the right to determine the confession of his own state, whether that be Lutheran, Calvinist, or Catholic. Again, to me, this is less important in the fact that Christians living in principalities where their denomination was not the established church were guaranteed the right to practice their faith in private as well as in public during allotted hours. So those two tenets of minority rights, the first being freedom from plunder and the second being freedom from persecution, have remained very important checks on the institutions of church and state to this day. Let me go to now the second example, illustrating my answer to the first kind of answer to the question. And I'm gonna be shifting now to the 19th century to a period I'm more familiar with, 19th century Germany. And I'm gonna be talking about a German pathologist named uh, Rudolf Virchow, who effectively founded what we now understand as modern social medicine. Vichero, as I mentioned, was a pathologist who belonged to a famous cohort of liberal German scientists who trained in Berlin under the biologist Johannes Müller, who, by the way, was the advisor of the subject of my biography. Now, in 1847 and 48, the Prussian government sent Virchow to study the typhus epidemic in Upper Silesia, which is a Prussian part of what's now Poland, Western Poland. And after seeing the victims of the typhus epidemic, he spent several months there, he developed a th his ideas on social medicine that he detailed in a 190 page report that became a turning point in German public health. Essentially, Virchow argued that health couldn't be maintained in conditions of poverty, malnutrition, filth, and ignorance. And if pressure wanted to prevent outbreaks of disease, it would have to civilize its citizens. So as two historians of medicine have described it, these are Theodore Brown and Elizabeth Fee, Virchow applied ideas on the social causation of disease derived from French and English sources to conditions in Silesia and showed a close and sympathetic familiarity with Friedrich Engels' stirring indictment, Conditions of the Working Class in England, which had just been published in 1844. And caught up in the heady atmosphere of his revolutionary times, Virchow enthusiastically endorsed what he proudly labeled radical political recommendations, namely the introduction of Polish as an official language, democratic self-government, separation of church and state, and the creation of grassroots agricultural cooperatives. And back in Berlin, he went on to found a weekly newspaper that promoted social medicine that ran under the banners, medicine is a social science and the physician is the natural attorney of the poor. This was, um, let me know, this is uh, after the outbreak of revolution in Berlin on the 18th of March, 1848. So he was moved back to Berlin 
and in the summer he was publishing this journal. Now eventually the revolution failed and the Prussian government pressured him to stop the publication uh, in June of 1849 and he lost his job and left for Berlin for the University of Würzburg in the south to hold the first German chair of pathological anatomy. And he retired from politics a bit. He concentrated on his scientific research, uh, did well, and eventually returned to Berlin eight years later in 1856 to take up the chair of pathological anatomy and physiology at the university and the director of the Institute for Pathology at the famous Charité Hospital. And he went back into politics alone, slightly uh, with a bit more moderation as one of the city's uh, counselors where he worked on reforming sanitation and public health. And his most famous accomplishment is the installation of sewers in Berlin, which was one of the fastest growing cities in the world at that time. So with his friend, the industrious Werner von Siemens, he helped found the German Progressive Party in 1861. And he was elected to the Prussian Diet as a leader of the constitutional forces opposed to Otto von Bismarck, who was the conservative chancellor of Prussia. And he continued his fight against Bismarck as Bismarck's most notable opponent, uh, besides the Catholic opposition. Virchow continued as a liberal to fight Bismarck as a member of the Reichstag from 1880 until 1893. Now, in consequence of his efforts and in an attempt to weaken the Socialist Party, which Bismarck had banned under the pretext of a terrorist act in 1878, Bismarck nonetheless realized that there were a lot of poor workers who were interested in socialism. And to uh, co opt Virchow's program and take the wind out of the sails of the socialist program or the social democratic as we'd understand it because they weren't revolutionary. They were a political party that was democratic. Bismarck offered health insurance to the working class in 1883 and the first system of national welfare. His initial law was expanded with accident insurance in 1884, disability insurance in 1889, and unemployment insurance in 1927 in an attempt to keep German workers from revolting, as they had in France in the Commune in 1871, and in Russia in 1917. Bismarck said, call it socialism or whatever you like. During the uh, Reichstag debates in 1881 over public policy, it's the same to me. The point is that the system worked. It was very popular. In 1885, the enrollment was 4.3 million Germans. By 1913, that number had jumped to 13.6 million, or a fifth of the population. That legislation, in my opinion, is a model that we would do well to consider. Okay, so that's so much for the first kind of answer to the question. Let me move on to the second kind of answer, which is to suggest that the main benefit of crises is that they spur societies to address problems that are chronic. On the other hand, the main risk of crises is that they threaten to destroy populations, trust, and liberty. So I'll offer three historical examples to illustrate the second point. The first is the, or rather the, yeah, is the economic responses to the Black Death of the 14th century. Now, that was the, probably the, well, yes, in historical record, it was the most devastating plague the world has ever seen, uh, wiping out, the estimates are now closer to 50 or 60% of the population, even more than what I learned, which was a third. And that enormous devastation of population obviously meant rising wages because there are fewer workers, a decline of payment in kind because workers could demand cash rather than goods, and centraliz centralization of capital as families gave less to charity. The rich 
had to pay more for their labor, so they were less charitable. And those three factors led to a rise of the towns, for example, as Italian textile entrepreneurs produced silk and linen cloth they formerly imported. In England, Crown imposed the Statute of Laborers in 1351, capping wages and imposing taxes, curfews, and quarantines. They were really worried about the whole feudal order being overthrown. Governments came to rely on wealthy families as Richard II, that's Richard the Lionhearted, did on the wool merchant Henry de la Pole, or Florence did on the Medici bankers. Merchants bought cheap land and gained influence, most clearly seen when Henry Tudor beat Richard III in 1485 in the Wars of the Roses, which ended baronial resistance and paved the way for the continued rise of corporations and central government. Monopolies on the trade of silver, copper, mercury, and spices led to criticism, often moral, against royal and papal banking, which relied on rich companies. In fact, Martin Luther published a tract in 1524 decrying the monopolistic collection of indulgences. That was money you paid the Catholic Church to get time off in purgatory, and arguing that trade should be for the common German good, and not just for the rich. I'll move on to the second example, the 1884 cholera epidemic in Naples. This was the last of the major cholera outbreaks, or waves of cholera outbreaks in the 19th century. Naples was also the largest city in Italy, with a population of nearly half a million, and it, it was poor. It hadn't reformed its sanitation. In the 1884 epidemic, according to Frank Snowden, was the worst of the eight outbreaks of cholera it experienced in the long 19th century. The disease hit the tenements that crowned the lower city, which housed about half of the population in a maze of 600 streets. It disproportionately affected the poor in what Snowden has described as environments with substandard housing, insecure water supplies, congestion, unwashed hands, malnutrition, and social neglect. Families consumed vegetables fertilized with human waste or dipped in open sewers I didn't know this. Apparently the ammonia from the urine freshened the leaves for market. Forty percent were unemployed. The others earned paltry wages as dock workers, factory hands, railroad workers, fishermen, cobblers, seamstresses, blacksmiths, bakers, porters, tanners, hatters, peddlers, messengers, washerwomen, water carriers, and trash collectors. It's basically an enormous population of the precariat, people very, very poor. And as you can expect, several thousand people died in those conditions. After a few months, the, de the, disease, excuse me, the disease eventually abated uh, for reasons that are not clear, at least not according to Snowden. It may have had to do with the cooler weather in the fall, when less water was drunk. Government actions had mixed results. They instituted basically the plague responses of sanitary cordons, but those spread disease, disorder, and economic disruption by encouraging people to flee the city. There were bans on public assembly, regulation of burials, closure of workshops, cleaning of streets, the emptying of cesspits. And there was isolation of the sick, all of which may have helped to quell the outbreak. 
And what's interesting is that the affected, just like now, the affected in this cholera outbreak of 1884 were clearly apparent in a division of class. The rich, that is the doctors, the officials, and the priests, remain generally immune to infection. And it's clear why. They wash their hands. They didn't live in tenements. They didn't drink from cisterns. They didn't consume local fruit or vegetables or fish. Nonetheless, poor Neapolitans, it's just the comparisons are so striking to me, I can't help but make this aside, with conspiracy theories, poor Neapolitans regarded them as poisoners interested in eradicating the indigent. This paranoia wasn't helped by official behavior, by the way, which often involved arriving with weapons at night and ordering the surrender of the sick, their clothes, and their bedding for disposal. Moreover, officials lit sulfur bonfires. They thought that the acrid smoke of the sulfur would somehow combat the cholera. Instead, it just choked the residents. And they also required the sick to report their illness to the city hall, which didn't engender any good feelings. And as you might suspect again, the poor reacted with suspicion and violence. They barricaded themselves in their rooms rather than die in some anonymous hospital. They forced doctors to drink their own medicines of laudanum, which is a tincture of opium, and castor oil. They thought they were, the doctors were there to poison them. They attacked stretcher bearers and police. They erected barricades and stone soldiers. They rioted outside quarantine hospitals. They threw tables, chairs, mattresses, and stones out of the windows at the staff. And the mutinies even spread to prisons. The detainees attacked guards, seized wardens, forced the gates, and they only surrendered to the intervention from, from the army. They had to call in the army to quell the disturbance at the prisons. It, you should note that there was similar violence uh, during the experience of cholera in Paris when General Cavignac repressed the revolution of 1848 and then later in the century when Adolf Thiers crushed the commune of 1871. In both cases, outbreaks of disease uh, tended to encourage the government to imagine the poor as inherently savage. Now, epidemics only became less frequent with cleaner water supplies, better sewage systems, and improved housing after Hausmanization, uh, which is the name given to the rebuilding of Paris in the 1860s under uh, a minister named Hausmann. And Rizanamento, which I just learned is the rebuilding of Naples between 1889 and 1918, ordered by the Italian king Umberto I, Unfortunately, these measures only shifted disease to the suburbs in the case of Paris or after the government diverted funds from construction in rampant corruption and failed altogether in the case of Naples. Cholera returned to the city in 1911, encouraging the criticism of opposition parties of anarchists, Republicans, and socialists and threatened to shut down emigration from Italy and tourism to Italy. In response, Prime Minister Giovanni Giolitti ordered a policy of silence and statistical fabrication. Sounds like another major health institution I can think of. Cholera circulated once more, Frank Soden writes, but silently. Now, there was comparable mismanagement in the United States in Honolulu in 1900 when an outbreak of plague 
in the Chinese community prompted the Board of Health to incinerate garbage, renovate the sewers, quarantine the Chinatown, and burn the affected buildings. Officials set 41 fires, which, as you might imagine, quickly spread out of control and burned for 17 days. A fifth of the city was destroyed. 7,000 homeless Chinese, Japanese, and Hawaiians were housed in camps under armed guard for months. According to one historian of this incident, his name's James Moore, mismanaged compensation schemes worsened their suffering for years to come. By succumbing to the pressure for action, health officials had inadvertently precipitated what remains the worst civic catastrophe in Hawaiian history, one of the worst disasters ever initiated in the name of public health by American medical officials anywhere. Now I'm coming to my third and last historical example, illustrating this second kind of answer about the deleterious effects of responses to crises. This is the example of the German inflation of 1919 to 1923, which I studied in graduate school under um, a historian of banking of that period. Now that inflation is best understood as a consequence of the economic policies of the First World War. I mean, to be blunt, the Germans had no plan to pay for the war. They had, in the previous war against France, won, and they stuck the bill to the French, and the French paid it off. That was five billion French francs, which they stored in the citadel outside Berlin in the citadel of Spandau. But that, even that gold was only enough to cover one day's cost of fighting. The war cost approximately 98 million marks a day, which uh, quite obviously made it difficult for the German government to pay. So unlike Britain, which paid for between 20 and 30% of the costs through taxation, I mean, the British just tightened the belt and taxed people. This should sound familiar to you. Germany funded its costs through borrowing. The government had trouble raising funds uh, given that taxes were the province of local states and given that it, it couldn't borrow abroad at any time during the conflict. They were just shut out of international financial markets. Now that situation only worsened after the armistice. So when the army capitulated, basically turned over the situation to the social democratic government and said, okay, you clean up our mess. We'll back you if you take over this disaster. The government faced three alternatives. First, they could return to a pre-war parity requiring a reduction of prices. The idea there was if they had a massive deflation, that would yield enough budget surpluses to pay off the debt. This is kind of like IMF shock treatment, austerity, you could call it. The second was stabilization at the existing price level, which avoided the unpleasant effects of both deflation and inflation. And the last was continued inflation. They could just keep inflating the currency. The idea is depreciating the mark would diminish the value of everyone's debts, including the state's debts. So they just effectively pay back the debts with worthless money. Now they debated the proper course of action. There were some in favor of the deflationary policy, the austerity policy, that is of alleviating debt through loans, but they had trouble attracting investors. Basically the public didn't think they were good credit risk after they lost. And the government didn't want to make up the shortfall through taxation. As you can imagine, if they just soaked the rich, uh, the military would have backed a coup, and that would have been the end of democracy. And if they taxed everybody, well, 
that would have prompted a vote of no confidence. People would have voted them out of office. So faced with the pressures of demobilization, unemployment, and communist agitation, the leaders of Weimar chose to print money. I mean, this is what we're doing now. So in this respect, the inflation was the price Germany had to pay for having a parliamentary democracy at all. So that's how things were in 1919. Now, three and a half years later, by the summer of 1923, two events triggered a complete loss of confidence in German stability. First, J.P. Morgan, founder of Morgan Bank, he reported on the 10th of June that he didn't think that the mark would ever recover. And second, on the 22nd, excuse me, 24th of June, right-wing anti-Semites assassinated the Jewish foreign minister, Walter Ratnow. After that, nobody had any faith in the German government. The banks had difficulty keeping up with demand for money. They just, inflation just became hyperinflation. To give you an idea, inflation was about 100, 200 percent after 1919. After 1923, um, the money ultimately depreciated to one part in 10 to the 23rd, which is Avogadro's number. That's one followed by 23 zeros. Workers needed to be paid twice a day because the money would have its value between breakfast and lunch and lunch and dinner. Homeowners wallpapered with currency because it was cheaper than wallpaper. Postage stamps became more valuable than life savings. And eventually people just gave up on money altogether. They just bartered. Firms paid salaries in potatoes, lumps of coal, purchased cinema tickets, and money just lost all meaning. Now, you can imagine how this affected people's attitudes and behavior. Um, the best word is mania. In an economy where only commodities held any value, pre-war standards became unreasonable. So everyone was just eager to spend whatever money they had before it just evaporated in value. So prudent business owners, they would just buy anything. They'd borrow and buy. They engaged in enormous mergers, invested in unnecessary equipment, anything to get rid of the money. And as you also might imagine, as in most financial crises, the rich got richer. According to the latest story in Gordon Craig, industrials like Hugo Stinnis took out loans. I mean, if you take out a loan, you can pay it back with the worthless currency, so it's a good idea. Took out loans to buy up whole forests to supply pit, pops, pit props for his mines, to acquire the largest coal mine in Europe, to invest in iron and steel plants in Hungary and chemical and aluminum and timber interests in Romania and to build an empire of 150 periodicals and newspapers. Workers who had done comparatively well at the onset of inflation now suffered terribly in contrast. Four years after the armistice, only 30% of the German labor force was fully employed, and perhaps the worst victims were the old, the sick, and the young. Medical costs rose beyond the reach of most, and chronic shortages of food encouraged the spread of disease and malnutrition. Tuberculosis was especially widespread, affecting as much as a fifth of the population. Children also suffered higher rates of infant mortality as well as stunted growth, rickets, and a host of other diseases associated with that malnutrition. Ultimately, the mark was stabilized uh, under the Dawes Plan of 1924, which allowed for an influx of foreign investment, which reestablished the creditworthiness of the German government. And the Weimar Republic began to regain a measure of financial certainty. But despite uh, economic improvement, its shaky finances ultimately ended in the crash of 1931. That was a global crash. And then the global depression that followed that had results that you're all familiar with. So let's consider how economic weaknesses helped to destroy the Weimar Republic. 
The most certain effect of the inflation was a terrible fear of cutting interest rates. This is still true, by the way, in Germany. They're terrified of inflation, so they keep interest rates quite high. A decline of just one point of interest during the economic recovery of 1927 caused the German central bank's reserve ratios to fall 30%. So here it's obvious that anything resembling a return to the situation before the war would have engendered a currency depreciation, a huge loss of capital, or both. So in consequence, the German central bank kept money tight. And that monetary policy explains why interest rates and short-term investment remain high. And then you have this other sort of financial conundrum. Just bear with me, with me here. Why did the bond market remain high as well? Why were the yields on long-term bonds high? Now, according to one economic historian named Theo Balderston, the 1923 inflation scared investors away from holding short-term bonds. Consequent depression in the bond market led into the securities market, driving stock prices down and eventually precipitating a depression. The point is the average German investor didn't trust anything and didn't want to buy anything. They just hoarded the money. They didn't lend it out invested in stocks or basically buy bonds, which is a kind of loan. So the capital markets drive up, dried up. Now the politicians really had their hand tied, hands tied here because they could only borrow from the allies, but then there were conditions associated with that allied bar borrowing. So they didn't really have much room for maneuver economically and they responded in another area naming politics. They became authoritarian. And you can see evidence of this right from the get-go. For example, in 1923, Chancellor Stresemann used the army to crush insurrections on the right in the Ruhr and on the left in Saxony. And those actions set a dangerous precedent. The Chancellor at the end of the Weimar Republic, Chancellor Brüning, ruled by emergency decree in 1931, and that Desperate Act was little more than an admission of the government's political bankruptcy. One that the German citizens seconded two years later in general elections when Hitler came to power. So from that perspective, Hitler's rise to power might be regarded as a terrible consequence of an imperial government that started a war against the allies with no plan to pay for it other than sticking the bill to them after they had won. And that was the gross miscalculation. Let me conclude with a couple remarks. People are rightly concerned with crisis. However, from the perspective of history, chronic problems and the solutions to chronic problems matter at least as much as crises. As all my examples have shown, addressing crises is never without costs. However, the alternative is worse. Ignoring the victims, and even more important, ignoring the conditions of crisis. Public health, financial stimuli, and social welfare are the price we pay to live in a world that isn't racked with needless suffering. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I'm trying to get myself back. There I am, okay. So that was really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, Maybe I can start the Q&A um, by asking if you could talk a little bit about our present, you know, and how you see some of these kind of examples that you use from the past. Um, how might you apply some of that analysis to COVID-19 specifically? <laughs> 
Well, I think the examples indicate that the victims are always the weak and the poor, typically, disproportionately. And the responses to crises centralize power and centralize wealth. That you could see that in the um, responses to the Black Death. Uh, and you can see that in, in other examples. I was struck by the um, things that I've been paying attention to the news or just noticing, for example, conspiracy theories in the case of Naples, where you have a high handed response by the government and then really irrational responses by the poor who are freaked out. Uh, this seems uh, to have some resonance with today, the very strange conspiracy theories I've been running across. Um, I also noticed in the, in the Weimar case, um, that last illustration of what happens when you ignore a problem that's chronic for years. I mean, the answer is you, you, you end up with the dictatorship. It's just to be blunt. If your answer to everything is to have a violent response and then, you know, punish somebody and take their wealth and that doesn't work out, you're left not only having avoided the problems that led you to war in the first place, for example, Germany in the first world war, but then you have all the sequelae, you have all the problems of the war that you ignored during the war. They basically had an enormous debt and no way to pay for it. The government basically had no way to pay for it. Right. So, right, long-term, um, you see some, I noticed parallels between the, the short-term responses and then I noticed sort of, sort of like haunting or harrowing suggestions of what would happen if we don't address anything. Yeah. As a German historian, I can't help but have a kind of gloomy outlook. <laughs> so it doesn't look like we have any questions in the queue. Oh dear. I know. Oh, here's one. Let's see. I have to pull it up. Um, do you think pandemics strengthen trust in science and medical professionals or challenge them increasingly? It's a good Both. question. Both. I mean, that's a, that's a safe answer, but for example, um, in the 19th century, there was a rise in the, in the trust and authority of scientific medicine with um, the germ theory of disease that was developed by Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, among others, where they identified pathogens and they found that disease came from pathogens and didn't just arise out of bad air or uncleanliness itself, even though uncleanliness was rightly associated with pathogens, but people used to think, you know, this Marjorie, the people got disease from bad air, right? Malaria, bad air. But an interesting point about, say, Koch's identification of the tuberculosis bacillus in 1883, I believe that's the right date, is that, well, they didn't have a therapy until after the Second World War, effectively, until the, the discovery of streptomycin. So, you know, science can say, this is what's wrong with you, but they can't do much about it. Uh, and that leaves people frustrated who expect kind of miracles from scientists. And I would say the same thing is going on now. We can test for this virus, but we don't have much in the way of therapy besides effectively plague measures, which are quarantine and isolation. We don't, there's some hope that this, this new drug might help the worst cases, but we don't have a vaccine and we don't have a proven effective therapy for anyone. And I hope that that doesn't discourage people from, from trusting doctors and scientists. They're people and they're doing the best they can. They've always done the best they can, but they can't, they don't have magic wands. Yeah, so, no, that, that's a, a that's a really interesting issue. Like to think about the ways that, you know, what we can find out, and the idea that sciences move slowly, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it it moves slowly, and so we can't know things right away. And we're in this crisis, and 
the population is looking to scientists for the answer and all we can say, you know, all scientists can say is this disease exists and we don't know what to do about it yet, right? And so people are, the anxiety gets worse and worse and people get frustrated with the quarantine measures, right? Which have been going on historically forever, right? I mean, we don't have any, we don't have any other measures to offer. But let me suggest social medicine is the great lifesaver. I mean, I'm sure you believe this too. Yeah. It, not therapeutic interventions. Heroic therapeutic interventions are not the way you save lives. You save lives by keeping most people in the society healthy. That was true um, with the decline of tuberculosis. Uh, my advisor used to say that the uh, sulfa drugs won the last day of the battle in the war, but most of the decline could be attributed to improvements in uh, health that came from improvements in nutrition, sanitation, uh, real wages. Right. But this is not, this doesn't receive enough, this is maybe the main point of my lecture, these chronic solutions to chronic problems don't receive the attention they deserve. I and mean, people are expecting a magic bullet to fix the problems. But most problems, as I suggested, can't be fixed. They can only be managed. That was the point of my remark of Edward Tennant that technology and in a sense society doesn't solve anything. It just converts the acute to the chronic and the chronic can be managed. You can manage public health. You might not be able to find a rapid solution to every new pathogen. And there are going to be more, they tell us, right? This well, we've, got, we've got a bunch of questions now. Yeah, so. okay, good. Okay. So how have past pandemics led to the creation of institutions like public health departments, CDC, and do you think a new global public health structure will emerge after this pandemic? Right, the, the last part I don't know and I kind of doubt it given the resurgence of nationalism globally. However, the first part, yes. Pandemics, do, pan, pandemics basically created public health. Now to be blunt, they created it when the middle class and the rich became affected by the disease. The first legislation for public health, which was sanitary legislation, was passed in 14th century Italy. And that's because the Italians lived on top of each other. The rich lived on the first floor and the poor lived on the upper floors. And the poor people would throw their refuse out the window, so to speak. And that's not very pleasant. So. In England, when you know, the rich could live apart from the poor, they didn't care very much. It was when the members of parliament were there, I forget Marjorie would know this one summer and the Thames backed up and then all the sewage backed up and it was, there was a heat wave. They said, oh, maybe we should do something about sanitation in these poor districts because this is gross. So um, let me just qualify my answer by saying pandemics affect public health institution when they affect the rich and the middle class. No one actually, and this is terrible, historically, when they only, they typically affect the poor and no one really cares, to be blunt, what happens to the poor. To, to give you, just to, illustration, to illustrate that, there still is an AIDS pandemic in Africa that is killing hundreds of thousands every year. And people don't worry about it in the West because it's going on in Africa where people are poor. It's out of sight, out of mind. So when it starts affecting people with power and money, then something will happen. Yes, I agree with that analysis as a historian of medicine as well. Yes. <laughs> and public health. So um, people have written that pandemics give rise to labor politics and tend to improve labor condition. This pandemic has left a lot of people unemployed. Do you see that happening in the 21st century? You want me to take that? No. Yes, yes, Marjorie, Marjorie is the expert. And actually, yeah, I wanna hear what Marjorie has to say. Yes. Um, so so I'm, I'm working on unemployment and health. That's kind of what, I, what I've been working on recently. And um, in a lot of pandemics, is the example that Gabriel gave with the great Black Death um, in the 14th century, initially that created really good conditions for, um, for labor because um, there, is, there are labor shortages after pandemics, right? And so 
labor, um, the working classes are tend to be in good conditions because they can make demands. Um, it doesn't usually lead to unemployment. So we're in a really different kind of situation today that we both have of uh, this pandemic crisis, this public health crisis and unemployment at the same time. So it's a kind of historically, never historians don't like to say unique, but it's a historically unusual situation to have both unemployment and pandemic, um, you know, at the same time or the, or the result of it. So I don't know that we're going to see it. The hope I think is what Gabriel pointed out is that we will wind up with more social welfare programs um, that's not exactly kind of labor politics, but it's connected to it in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, it, on some level, it, we could see a shift to the left um, coming out of this, just in terms of demands for social welfare. That would be my broad answer. And someone pointed out to me, Marjorie, to add on to what you're saying that there are provisions in our own constitution to address these inequalities. Essentially, everyone who's been put out of work by government action could form a class and sue the federal government or the state governments under the Fifth Amendment. Because under the Fifth Amendment in the takings clause, you can't take anyone's property without compensation. So that could be a vehicle to the redistribution of wealth to all those who have been adversely affected. We'll see. All right, here's <laughs> another question. One of the sure. differences between the COVID pandemic and the historical examples you cited is that technology has enabled quick communication of different approaches to control and the relative effectiveness of each. Yet mm -hmm. in many jurisdictions, there is an apparent refusal to look at the evidence. How might we overcome this refusal to learn from contemporary experience? Why wouldn't countries look to those other countries um, that have been relatively more successful than their own? Uh, <laughs> so you're asking a professor why people aren't more sensible? Um, well, I'm a historian, so I studied the record of human behavior and there's, it's not optimistic about people getting more sensible just because they have better technology. That's my belief. I mean, the rise of the telegraph, the rise of writing in, uh, the Greeks discussed this. They, didn't, they were worried that if you wrote things down, you wouldn't be able to ask questions of your interlocutor and you might misunderstand what was, the author was intending because you couldn't question them. So the fact that we have technologies doesn't mean that we're gonna be more sensible. Um, so the question is why aren't people more sensible? I, I don't think I have an answer for that. I'm working on it. You're here, so you're working on it. Right. All right. It, it seems like throughout your examples and even today, a common issue is the communication and trust in communication between those most at risk poor, older, and younger people, and those with understanding. Yeah, I mean, there, I'll say something maybe conservative. I believe in checks and balances. So I think this pandemic is an example where there has to be a distribution of authority and distribution of power and distribution even of skepticism. I wouldn't want to have too much centralization of decision making, say like the example of the public health burning down an entire Chinatown. They thought they had the situation in control and they didn't. I think it's good that we have an American system where there are checks and balances purportedly and that the population can ask questions of their leaders, political, medical, scientific. So I hope that there, that's a marketplace of truth I hope there's experimentation and, and doubt and skepticism. And I hope that that sort of battle of opinion, in fact, will eventually produce a good outcome. 
Right. Um, can this pandemic bring about necessary change in inequality and how? From a historical perspective, how do we address and fix wealth gaps? I mean, historically, the, typically the diseases have worsened inequality, as Marjorie pointed out, which is kind of depressing. But I think that's not inevitable. Um, I think if enough of the middle class and the rich uh, are affected, they can join with the poor and form a common policy to the benefit of everybody. Let's hope that that happens soon. Yeah. Can you say more about how chronic conditions lead to dictatorship? Ah, that's a really good question. And I was hoping someone would ask that. That's my last example. Well, if you don't address problems of inequality of public health over the long time, then your room for maneuver diminishes. And um, then you don't really have any solutions to offer in crises other than authoritarian ones that give people the belief that their leaders have things under control, but they don't. So that usually involves scapegoating um, and uh, basically quelling any debate and the kinds of things you've seen in authoritarian leaders on the right and the left. So, um, uh, it, that, that remains a, a possibility, but I'm hoping that um, uh, we're more sensible. So that our next lecture next week is on um, the yellow peril, so-called, so kind of scapegoating exactly, um, th thinking about the ways that pandemics wind up with certain populations being targeted. So um, what role do we have as academics to build trust in fields like science and communication from them? Well, I think people need to learn uh, the liberal arts and sciences. I think if they learned what scientists do and what historians do and what anybody who operates uh, in the search for truth without the search for certainty, let me say that. And that's the two fields I'm closest to, science and history. This is the search for truth, but not to be equated with the search for certainty. You're operating with relative certainty, not absolute certainty. I think that that will lead you away from the scylla of blind faith and the charybdis of utter narcissistic, nihilistic skepticism. And I think that liberal arts uh, classes like this really help. I mean, obviously I'm convinced because it's what I do. Yes. Um, what is the historical relationship between pandemics and revolution? As you point out, pandemics disproportionately affect the poor, which is also the majority, at least by numbers, if not power. Do pandemics lead to political backlash or uprisings? Yes. Now, you all know that. I mean, I'm glad you picked up on that. The revolutions of 1848, there were cholera outbreaks immediately beforehand. There were um, food shortages with... Um, crop failures in 1847, so you all know that. And then you all know about the repression. Now let me point out something you might be less aware of. This is coming from the classic work of the medical historian, uh, Erwin Ackerknecht. And he talked about the role of doctors as liberal or even radical reformers in revolutions in the 19th century. Doctors, as I mentioned Viochio, they were among the most radical because they saw at first hand the social effects of bad governmental policies. So this is what's uh, I think perhaps in, uh, most interesting is that uh, I think this is true today. You have uh, Médecins Sans Frontières and even you could argue other professions like liberation, liberation theology in Latin America. People who work with the afflicted understand that the change has to include politics. And that's something that's less well understood. 
And that may be a reason if I want to go out on the limb, why academics and professionals are often demonized because the academics understand the political component of these things and they understand it's not purely biological. Yeah, so that's a really good answer. Do you think it is a coincidence that the Black Lives Matter movement picked up so much momentum during this pandemic? Um, Black Lives Matter movements have taken place in the past, but not nearly with so much coverage and multiracial participation. Here I can only speculate and tell you how I feel. I, this is just an opinion. But the difference I see, and I'm, I'm an old guy, I remember 1968, and I remember all those protests, and the burning of Newark, Newark and the burning of uh, Detroit. And I think if there's a difference between now and 68, you have a large, young, white, middle-class and poor population that are joining uh, black demonstrators in a way that there wasn't that solidarity in 68. There were, there were sort of two movements. There was like the left-wing college students and then there were the angry, uh, maybe more radical blacks who were really facing the brunt of the abuse. And now I think what's happened is maybe two things. This is kind of depressing. I think enough of young college students have been immiserated over such a long time that they can really identify with uh, hopeless out, if not hopeless, then really bad economic outlooks. And so they feel solidarity with the blacks who are being disproportionately abused. And I also think that a lot of people have been quarantined or lost work and they understand how it feels maybe to be feeling, feeling really helpless. And uh, I think that has engendered greater solidarity, but those are just two opinions. So I don't really know, but that's just, that's just my feeling. So, and finally, oh, I just lost the question. Um, this was going back to an earlier, um, the point about technology um, and communications. Oh, right, the refusal to look at evidence how we might overcome this refusal to look, learn from contemporary experience. And you were saying people hadn't gotten more sensible. Um, and the questioner put another comment in saying, perhaps part of the answer to my question, giving the, given the evidence internationally from this pandemic, is that control measures may have more sex <laughs> success when the affected population has high levels of social cohesion. I don't know if I understand that. Can you? Sure, so I'll read the original question. Yeah. One of the differences between the COVID pandemic and the historical examples cited is that technology has enabled quick communication of different approaches to control and the relative effectiveness of each. Yet in many jurisdictions, there's an apparent refusal to look at the evidence. How might we overcome this refusal to learn from contemporary experience? Why wouldn't countries look to those other countries that have been relatively more successful than their own? And you made a comment that people just haven't gotten more sensible. And um, this questioner said, perhaps part of the answer to my question, given the evidence internationally from this pandemic, is that control measures may have more success when the affected population has high levels of social cohesion. Uh, yes. So maybe you're referring to Western Europe. But we live in the United States where there's a lot of difference in opinion and that's not necessarily bad. It's not necessarily bad that we don't have a lot of social co cohesion. We could turn that into a strength. You could look outside of your uh, normal circle of friends and people who share your opinions and start engaging with people who don't share your opinions and look very critically at their claims and then have dialogues with people who don't believe what you believe. And that I've tried to do that and that has changed some of my opinion and that has caused me to doubt other things that I believe and that has reinforced things that I believe. I think a high level of social cohesion, I mean, to be blunt, I'm a German historian and that's, um, that is their ideal of how to solve political problems. Uh, it, you know, goes back to the 
political theory of Jürgen Habermas, where the idea is basically you get a bunch of reasonable, rational, it's always men who are educated and they sit around at the table and then they arrive at the right answer because they're all reasonable and rational. But that's not politics. Politics is about values. And sometimes you can all agree on the facts, but not agree on the values of what to do with that. For example, in this pandemic, well, there's security, which is public health. There's justice, right? And there is liberty. And not, I don't know that we can square all those. We might have to compromise. And the people who are um, worried about liberty or people who are worried about justice or people who are worried about security are all correct to worry about it. And I don't have an answer for how to, f to work that out, but we have to, as a society, talk to each other and arrive at a solution that is reasonable. So just saying, you know, the French and the German Western European political tradition aims at social cohesion. And often that means repressing voices that dissent, which I'm an American. I don't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, thank you very much, Professor Finkelstein. This was, that wound up being a really great um, question and answer session. Thank um, you. So we look forward to our next session on Monday, which is Professor Faye Karanen from Ethnic Studies, who, as I said, will be looking at kind of the history of the yellow peril um, and how that kind of affects what we've been seeing with a lot of anti-Asian American sentiment um, during COVID-19. So thanks again, and we hope to see you next week and have a I'm thinking of the weekend already, but have, have a good rest of the week. Okay. Thank you.